So, okay, so where are we going to do? So we've, we've covered a lot about, well, we've covered an awful lot <laughs> in Stuff. that segment. Stuff. We could, I think, would be really useful to, to have a little um, yeah, discussion yeah. around White Matlack and his, okay. who he was. Okay. So, so Ralph, if you, if you wouldn't mind, could you, could you tell me a little bit about White Matlack and sure. what we know about him? Sure. Um, he's a pretty historical figure. Right? He was in history alive at a historic time. Uh, the uh, American Revolution. Um, he also um, had a brother uh, that was active. He had a, the, his brother was actually the scribe for the Declaration of Independence. So he was playing at a high level and known to people. And the clock trade in general, I, I, you know, a clock maker was, just because I was a clock maker doesn't mean I'm gonna, why I'm saying this, but I think a clock maker had to be skilled not only in producing something, but had the skill in mathematics. So they were smart, smart people, and um, became well known in the communities. Um, a lot of these people were in the American Philosophical Society. Clockmakers ran through that society where you know, Ben Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, these were figures uh, in the political world that were also members, but there are a lot of clockmakers too. Well, Franklin was known for the developing the Franklin dial, which is That's that it. peculiar way of showing time right. using a spiral uh, chapter it. rather than it's what we have here in front of us. It really didn't catch on, but it was, I think mean, Ben Franklin was always looking to simplify things. He felt like the simpler something was, the fewer moving parts, the better it will be. Fewer chances for failure. And uh, so, yeah, the, and, and people that were smart in mathematics would talk to people in astronomy, and the, they were all sharing ideas and trying to figure out this world. And it was an interesting time because, you know, there was a lot of, uh, people were open to learning a lot of new things. They weren't just, they were moving off of the farms and moving to the cities, at least here in the States. And so... It was a historically important time, and this man, White Matlack, was playing at that time. He uh, he was also, well, the United States was, uh, even after they declared their independence, was struggling with the slavery issue. Um, I mean, in the Declaration of Independence, it says all men are created equal, and here we have a group of people that weren't. They weren't free, and uh, he was an abolitionist uh, when it really wasn't real popular. Matter of fact, they had a hard time getting all the states together in that regard because the South was a different economy, a different type of farming. They needed to have tremendous acreage to produce the foodstuffs and product that they were making. They needed they needed workmen. It was a way of satisfying that demand for workers. I get up into Pennsylvania, it seems like all the farms are 100 acres. Well, that, that's a starter farm in the South. Uh, you know, it's nothing to see a farm that wasn't thousands of acres. Not that they farmed the whole plot, but they, they were farming broad expanses and they were the source of uh, food for the North a lot of times. So, you say that White Matlock was involved in this abolitionist Correct. movement. Can you say a bit more about the, how how we know that? Well, I uh, I didn't actually know it about White Matlock, and one of our other members told me about this fellow, and yeah, he was uh, active in that regard, and he was uh, uh, instrumental in forming an abolition, abolitionist society in New York City. Uh, eventually in, oh, what was it, about 1808, finally the United States at that time said no more in importation of slaves into the United States. So they effectively cut off after that point. And it was due to these people raising their voices and saying, we've got problems with this. It was the first step 
toward abolition. And uh, unfortunately, white man like didn't get to see, you know, um, the Emancipation Proclamation that was presented by uh, President Lincoln. But there was a continued effort in his followers and subsequent people, and finally, uh, they abolished slavery in the 1860s. Uh, well, the war had gone on for a couple of years before they were able to push this through, but um, they did. And uh, uh, post-war, uh, the world changed and uh, saw a tremendous change. The farming system changed. Those large plantations, by and large, they could, just couldn't, they didn't have the manpower to keep them up, so they were divided up. And all of a sudden, blacks could be owners and they could have the farm, their own farms and generate their own wealth. And like I said, that was a game changer. It really was. So, so as well as being um, pro-abolition of slavery, so White Matt, like, was he the scribe? No. Or was it his, a family he, member? I thought, I thought it, was it was his, his brother. brother. Yeah. I thought it was his brother, and memory serves me. So it, it seems, seems like that. The, the picture that is starting to sort of emerge here is that these these guys were really quite involved in. Oh, they were. They were. I mean, in in this uh, yeah, the, the sort of almost at the epicenter of this extraordinary right. historical time. That's right. It was. It was exciting. I mean, naturally, the war. I mean, it. People were dying too, but it was there was a lot of change. You know, we were pushing away from England at the same time. White Matt, White Matt Lack, and other people were saying, "Hey, you know, we need to keep going down this path." Particularly after the war, during the war, yeah, the goal was, and he was not a Tory, where he was against the war with England. A lot of people were; they wanted to hold on to being a colony of England, and. Uh, but the majority of people wanted their freedom and fought for it. And um, it seems like, I don't know if White Matt Lack, I believe he fought in the Revolutionary War too. I'm just trying to remember some of the things I learned about him. But, but it he, sounds as though, I mean, this, this, this clock has come to the museum. Uh, in, it came in 2020, just mm -hmm. as all, all this um, you know, again, another period of historical change in the right. world where we all were kept inside for a long time. Wow. That was. The, the, I think that this is a really, this is going to be a very interesting starting point for some you know, research. It, it's neat to to recognize the effort that we have made and continue to make to embrace all men are created equal. Um, you know, this is the start of that movement. It continues today. You know, um, it's a struggle. Uh, but these people were trying, you know, this is, we're talking about 240 years ago. Uh, it's a long time ago it's we've been having that struggle. But anyway, he was, uh, he was a, one of the many starters. And it, it is, I, I think it made, we see so many clocks that come down with no history or not much information about the maker or some not many makers were as involved as this one um, not to say that some clock makers weren't in government uh, there was some of that not a whole lot yeah and it's interesting it, it again it, it brings up that it sort of challenges the assumption doesn't it that the name that you see on the dial Right. was the person who toiled throughout the night, you know, turning the parts, yes. assembling the parts and yes. finishing everything. And it, it seems in this case it's quite unlikely that um, Matt Lack, he well, was more of a businessman. He perhaps. was, and he was a silversmith, and so he, I think he had a degree of training. A lot of times these people would do repairs, mm -hmm. uh, watches and clocks. I see a lot of that. I don't see much of that. Um, combination of skills, watchmaker, clockmaker. Usually you're either a watchmaker or a clockmaker. Years ago, um, a clockmaker would fit up crystals and make repairs and everything. Some more skilled than others. 
I remember um, hearing about um, a diary of a clockmaker mm -hmm. who, and I say clockmaker, he worked on watches in the daytime uh -huh. when the light was good oh, and then wow. moved to clocks in the evening wow. when he didn't require such, yeah. such well, good lighting. That's why I never uh, touched a watch. <laughs> 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 I, uh, I, I'm, I always marvel. You want to see something that's technically advanced to miniaturize that movement in the form of a watch, which is basically what's different escapement. We talked about recoil and deadbeat escapement. Different escapement, but it's still that transfer of power from each drive gear to a receiving pinion, drive gear to the next receiving pinion, release of power over a controlled rate. But it's totally different tooling. People always ask me, do I repair watches? No, I never did. And I told them, I'll give you an analogy. It's sort of like the difference between an automobile and a car. They're both modes of transportation, but totally different tooling on the two. I'm not going to say which one was better. but uh, <laughs> No, I think it would probably be not a good course of action to start debating which is better than watches <laughs> or clocks. There's a no win. <laughs> <laughs> but it's been absolutely fascinating to talk with you Ralph about this one. This is a clock that has just seen, it, it was created in yeah. a time of extraordinary change and it's lived through all of that and, and come to the museum. I tell you, and it's come down in such good shape. I mean, the finish on this clock, just like the woods and the attention to detail on the moldings and everything. Again, I use the term top drawer. It is top drawer. Uh, it's uh, uh, going to be a beautiful clock. You know, we're res having the feet restored on the clock. And uh, it's going to make a big improvement on the clock. A lot of times we really see, I'm sure you see so many English clocks with missing feet or feet that have rotted off. I mean, I always say the English have so many stone floors and homes and everything, and they were mopping down the floor. Here in the States, uh, we had more wood floors, and it didn't get quite that regular mopping. Usually, I find that most of the clocks that are missing elements was done to decrease the height. Got The clock at some point got into a lower ceiling. So with this clock, I mean, going back to the style of the case being very, very representative of what you see coming out of the northwest of England. Correct. Um, the OG type of foot is is what I would expect to see on this clock. It, uh, I believe that's going to be the case. Um, uh, the uh, cabinet maker that just got the case is going to be looking at this. He, uh, he's going to look for signs, uh, and there typically are signs of remnants of glue and what the the, um, the amount that you see on there and that'll that'll guide the, that cabinet maker in knowing what to produce. I think that that's one of the wonderful things about working with antiques mm -hmm. is that there is all that sort of um, archaeological evidence it there is. to give you the clues as right. to what was there before. And of course, the work that will be carried out on this case will mm -hmm. be entirely reversible. That's so correct. if somebody comes along and says, that's absolutely wrong because I've got an original white light -like case of the right. same proportion and it has straight feet. Yeah. And we, so it's, it's one of those things, isn't it? it? Yeah, it's, it's a constant learning process. I've learned something today from you. <laughs> but uh, it's, uh, it, it, and that's why I enjoy working on a movement of a clock in. You found joy, that joy too in restoring mechanisms and it, it does, you, you, you do look for those signs of if bits are missing or been poorly repaired in the past. You look at the clock and the clock will tell you if you're open to it and it takes time, but uh, if you're open to uh, how this should look, what's wrong here, what's, uh, what's not right. And sort of looking at what has been changed correct and then working back why was it changed correct and then sometimes there are multiple sort of yeah. little milestones in the clock's history where changes have made and then there's further changes to correct sure. that it's, it's you know the the clocks uh, sometimes are touched by good hands and sometimes not um, you know you 
we'll see all kinds of things done on the clock that maybe were done by someone that had was a fix-it man and had a level of knowledge, but he maybe didn't have the skills to pull off this restoration. Um, it's it's just a reality when you start talking about something that's 240 years old. A lot of people have touched it, and especially a clock like this. Going back to the condition that you talked about, and I was talking about, the clock that has survived in this condition has always been well thought of. It didn't get out to the barn or up in the attic or down in the basement. Um, one thing I'm going to be real anxious to see is once we silver the dial, again, the brass dial, is this is just isn't right. Well, this is something that I want to look at very carefully because we need to be sure that there is evidence sure. that there was silvering. Sure. And we need to have a yeah, we need to have a good conversation yeah. about what is what is the justification. Sure. And you know, how will it help us to tell the story of right. the clock, white mat like. Yeah. But but I think what one thing that you've just said has really hit home that this was always a quality clock and it was a cherished item. It was. And for 240 years it's been very well looked after. Yeah. Uh, I wish they all looked that way. <laughs> That's brilliant.